Of all the Emperor's sons, Rogel Dorn stands out as an individual of unflinching loyalty, defiant resolve, and thunderous zeal. We've talked so much about a lot of the other Primarchs that are known for their flourish, uh, tragic storylines, or wide-sweeping effect on the Grander Imperium. Rogel Dorn has always had this sort of behind-the-scenes feel. Uh, even through a lot of the older Index of Stardust lore, Rogel Dorn didn't play so heavily a hand in the heresy itself, either attacking or defending. His true worth came about during the Siege of Terra itself as the Praetorian of Terra. In this video, we're going to talk about Dorn's upbringing, his success during the Great Crusade, and subsequent rivalries. Moreover, we're going to go into what becomes of the legacy of Dorn and the shame that loomed over the Primarch in his later years. Join me in a long overdue journey into our next Primarch, Rogel Dorn, the Praetorian of Terra. Inuit is where our drama begins, which is in no way a take on the word Inuit. Games Workshop would never be that transparent about a thinly veiled name. Surely you jest. Like his brother Lehman Russ, Dorn lands on a death planet covered in ice. It's adjoining sun, old and dying. Let's not confuse this with Fenris, though. Inwit survived Old Knight as a bit of a pocket empire, a lot of their technology left intact after the collapse from the Age of Strife. And if you don't know what this is, take a look in the upper right corner of the screen. Uh, you should find a link to my video on Old Knight and the Age of Strife. It's an immensely, immensely sparse but important part of the history of the early Imperium. Now, the people of Inuit were a tenacious lot, built to withstand any circumstance, endure and survive, no matter the hardship, no matter the outcome. This is a planet riddled with Florida-level Cat 7 ice storms that rip through the planet, freezing things within seconds. In addition, predatorial wildlife roams the planet looking for any food, including humans. This creates a people that will make up the blueprint for the Imperial Fists to come. Grim, resolute, strong, but defiant. Now, we've talked about a lot of the other death worlds, but as I said, a lot of the technology of the former Golden Age of Technology was still present on Inuit, and with it, the people eventually grew their pocket empire of sorts, spanning out into the stars. This creates two things. One, you have a population that is incredibly adaptable, having already steeped their hands in differing planets, technology, and means of conquest. Second, you have the need to reinforce these new planets, an ideal that also makes up the fabric of Rogel Dorn and the Imperial Fists to come. And all these things happen before Rogel Dorn even gets to the planet, which is important to note because most of the Primarchs were the zeitgeist for their home planet's expansion, not the other way around. Rogel Dorn grew up learning the ways of the Inwit Empire and how Inwit clung to the old ways as a means of preserving tradition and strengthening the roots that made the stalwart people that spanned their small corner of the universe. Behind the wall of orbital defense platforms and sprawling shipyards lay the same foundational clans and ice hive conflicts from pre-stellar expansion. Now, as much as I want to go into the early life of Rogel Dorn, as his uh, many exploits, like, no one could forget that time he shoplifted some e-cigs, they just don't exist. Uh, and I'm not sure if this is Black Library's intention uh, to make his latter life the focal point, or they're waiting for the Primark series books on him in specific, but there's not much written on it. Not even in the Index of Stardust. Yet, at least. But... At the time of this video, the Siege of Terra is just getting started in the Horus Heresy book series, so maybe we'll get more as time progresses and we'll get some kind of peer into that. But what we do know is that Rogel was raised and named as a child of the House of Dorn, rising to prominence fast as every Primarch does. He was trained in the way of technology, strategy, diplomatic relations, and tactics from his grandfather. On Inuit, the ruling house you live under becomes your surname. Your clan name is as it were. Ruling from their Ice Castle, quote-unquote, which is just as badass of a name for an otherwise frosty character, Dorn progressed up to the ruler of Inwit, and thus the Inwit Cluster. The story goes, as you would expect it, under his guidance, the Inwittans, or Inwitians, In Inwitians, whatever the hell, expanded their burgeoning empire even further. Rogel's brilliant tactical mind allowed him to retrain the military and build starships far beyond the comprehension of previous rulers of the empire. When the Emperor came to Inwit, it was already forged into a massive stellar empire, ready to wage war in the name of the Great Crusade. And there isn't even a, a, like a haughty meeting in which the Emperor had to prove himself, or like a bro-out moment of crushing Natty Light in the back of Lehman Russ's Thunderhawk. Instead, Rogel Dorn presented the Emperor with a gift, the, the massive starship slash mobile fortress, the Phalanx. 
It was discovered, dormant and abandoned, within the Inwit system and was brought back to life by Dorn. The Emperor is, seems, or kind of appears to be ingratiated by the gesture and the gift. The Emperor then returns the phalanx to Dorn in the same moment it is gifted to him. Way to re-gift things, Empy Poo, the galactic equivalent of a white elephant with gifts you just kind of don't like. Now, the phalanx becomes a mobile fortress monastery to the other grand gift that the Emperor bestows upon Rogel Dorn, the Seventh Legion. The newly renamed Imperial Fists. Dorn meshed almost immediately with his sons, all built in his image from his gene seed, already embodying the defiant, stoic, and resolute manner of their master. And it is said that upon meeting the Legion Master Matthias and other leaders of the Legion, Rogel Dorn said nothing. <laughs> and he finally spoke to his sons after watching their resolve on the battlefield. And this is this is very true of the man behind the name of Rogel Dorn. Dorn is always painted in a very grim and quiet light. Uh, I would say enigmatic, but there's not mystery behind it. He simply is overly dedicated to the pursuit of the Imperial truth, the ideals of the Emperor and the Imperium as a whole. There is an unflinching loyalty in his eyes, sure, but there is also a wild zeal hidden just underneath the surface. It is this zeal that is reflected into his sons that has created so much of the success of the Seventh Legion. Regarded as one of the best military minds of all the Primarchs for his ability to construct masterful defenses and brilliant battle plans with the occasional zeal that helps as sort of a X factor to the otherwise logical pursuits of some of his brothers. And that's, that's really the crux of both the Primarch and his Legion. Although seemingly staunch and without character, their singular drive to succeed and persevere in the face of any adversity creates a terrifying monster behind the stone mask that Dorn wears flawlessly. The Great Crusade then went on just as you would imagine it from a Primarch so dedicated to the ideals of the Imperium. As a seventh Primarch to be discovered, which which you guys should know plays no part in their Legion number, it's just kind of pure coincidence. The Dark Angels are the first Legion, but Horus was the first to be discovered, uh, with Lehman Russ second in line. So as the seventh Primarch to be discovered, Rogel Dorn had a long time to cement his legacy amongst the nascent Imperium as well as alongside his growing frat, Delta Iota Kappa. The Imperial Fists clung heavily to the traditions set out by Dorn and the people of Inwit. Legion Master Matthias was even named High Castellian of the Inwit Cluster and was immediately tasked with creating 30 more Imperial Fist regiments from their homeworld. Again, I have to really reaffirm how the already present value system in the Legion meshed so well with the Inwits that there was very little Terran Inwit pushback, unlike in other legions like the the Red or I'm sorry, the White Scars or the Raven Guard. And we talked about some of those values early, earlier, but it's worth bringing up be again because it plays so heavily into the Seventh Legion's dogma. With every planet they captured, they reinforce, then move on. Wogeldorn was not concerned with the administration and legislation of the planets brought into compliance. He wholly believed he was a warrior of the Imperium, not a bureaucrat. As thus, he would maintain a small garrison, establish compliance and peace, and then again, just would move on. This sort of quasi-Alexander the Great approach to conquering actually created the least amount of discontent from any newly compliant system compared to the other Primarchs. All the traditions of the pre-existing culture were pretty much left intact, with the exception of the imperial secular truth supplanting any religious dogma. And there's a famous instance on a little known place called Necromunda, where the imperial fists pushed the orcs out of the system. The Hive Lords erected a massive fortress chapel in honor of the Imperial Fists, offering up recruits as sort of a tithe to the Seventh Legion. And this was actually pretty customary, to take recruits as a means of tithe from planets freshly brought to compliance. But Dorn refused, saying that he'd rather have recruits versus vassals. Essentially, he was saying he wanted uh, willing recruits versus rancorous ones, you know? Uh, again, reaffirming this notion wherein a military unit was in place, but none of the civic or political responsibilities that other legions would strive for. And for over 160 years, Dorn pushed the outermost boundaries of the Great Crusade, able to rapidly redeploy to help out other legions or any of his expeditionary fleets due to the nature of the phalanx. In Flight of the Eisenstein, we get a really great idea of just how just colossal or just massive this ship is. I mean, remember, 
Legions are many, many, many times larger than a modern Space Marine chapter, and the Phalanx was able to comfortably fit plenty of the elements of the 7th Legion, let me just say. Uh, Robot Guillemin even regards Rogel Dorn as one of four Primarchs, the Dauntless Few as he calls them, that best embody their father's ideals with unflinching loyalty and total faith in the secular truth of the Great Crusade. And the others amongst this, that list are uh, Sanguinius, Ferus Manus, and Lehman Russ. What I like about all the Dauntless Few is how good their individual character arcs are and how very flawed each of the Dauntless Few truly are while also being self-aware of it. Well, maybe not, maybe not Ferris Manus, you know, he kind of loses his head before he has a chance to kind of come to terms with his temper. But through all of this, Rogel Dorn fought alongside almost all of his brothers, each one to great success for the most part. I mean, Dorn possessed the ability to comfortably adapt to each Primarch's fighting style with a few kind of standout instances here and there. And I think we've come to expect the internal fighting, I guess you could say, of brothers with each Primarch we've talked about so far. And there's a particularly poignant instance where Rogel, where Rogel Dorn witnesses the brutality of the Night Lords firsthand, you know, re rebuking his brother, Conrad Kurz, and getting into a savage melee that almost claims one of the brothers' lives. Um, that's definitely a story for, for Kurz on that one, because um, that leads to Kurz's sanction and a bunch of other issues that are way more spanning into his character. Now, through a lot of this conflict, Dorn had earned an incredible reputation as a master of defense. Indeed, you know, Horus had even remarked in the earlier Horus Heresy that if the Luna Wolves, masters of assault, had ever been pitted against the Imperial Fists, masters of defense, the conflict would be an eternal stalemate. And that notion would soon be tested in time. Uh, the old adage of a movable object and unstoppable force kind of comes to mind here which lends very well into the next portion of what I'm going to talk about. With the end of the Ulinar campaign, the Emperor names Horus as the War Master, who recalled to Terra and complete his next great project, the work in the Great Webway. We've talked about that millions of times now. But he takes with him Rogel Dorn and the 7th Legion, charging them with the reinforcement and construction of the Imperial Palace. This sends the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Urtarabo, into a fit of rage. I mean, he has a temper tantrum so bad that the other members of his legion, and I'm not speaking in hyperbole here as I, as I am wont to do, are completely dumbfounded. Both of these Primarchs are both siege and defense masters, so for the Emperor to take Dorn over Perturabo was seen as a massive slight to the Master of the Iron Warriors. Perturabo made so many mad Twitter posts that the two essentially rarely spoke after that moment. I mean, honestly, this was a pretty long-spanning conflict between the two. Both are equally as stubborn and resolute in their own persecution of war across the galaxy. While they both lent their expertise to siegecraft as well as the defenses, they had different executions. Perturabo favored overwhelming application to specific hardpoints, oftentimes sustaining massive casualties with an ends justifying the means kind of approach. While Dorn, on the other hand, would never accept large casualties as a measure of success unless absolutely necessary. What it really came down to was Dorn's idealism versus Perturabo's pragmatism. Perturabo only saw logic without theory, while Dorn lived heavily in the theoretical, building out success from multiple approaches, going with the path that granted him not only success in the moment, but continued success. As Rogel Dorn is recalled to Terra, he joins the Hor or with Horus's 63rd Expeditionary Fleet for a few engagements. And from this, we get to peer into the mind of how Horus views Primarchs such as Guillemin and Dorn. And this is kind of a bit of a segue from the ultimate story of Dorn, um, but I want to, it's kind of worth going into. It's a really cool moment here. But you have to remember that with the promotion to Warmaster, some Primarchs railed against the decision, you know, deeming themselves worthy or cursing their father for abandoning them, you know, whatever it was. This was not the case with Dorn. He saw it as a natural progression. Horus was the first and closest Primarch to the Emperor. The only legion to come close to Horus' accomplishments were the Imperial Fists, and even then it was not by a close margin. Ultimately, Dorn was reserved and resolute, where Horus was charismatic and prone to a, a good flourish, making him a better fit as his ability to connect with his brothers was above that of Dorn's. Dorn got along well with most of them, and he was not overly loved like Horus was by so many, Primarch and otherwise. But Horus, though, actually looked up to Dorn, and Giamman, and even Jagtai Khan, much in an older brother sort of light. And I think this is more because of the demeanor of all three of those Primarchs, 
being, you know, rather stoic and, and very resolute in their adherence to their father's ideals. Horus remarks that Dorne is one of the most brilliant tacticians in the Imperium because it combines so many great aspects of the other Primarchs. The disciplined approach of Guillemin, the courage of Lionel Johnson, but with the flashes of zeal and tenacity that Lehman Russ and the Khan had in spades. This is where we get that notion from above about, you know, Horus's remark about Dorne's ability to defend versus Horus's propensity for assault. After leaving the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, Dorne takes to the reinforcement of Holy Terra itself. Since the Unification Wars, not much had been done in the way of fortifying or even cementing Terra's claim as the capital world of the millions of planets of the Imperium. The Emperor had deemed the Imperial Fists would be the Emperor's Praetorians, tasked with building up the fortifications that the Imperial Fists were so renowned for. This all happens right on the back of the Isvan massacres and the outbreak of the Horus Heresy. You know, massive warp storms bar Dorne's full retreat to Terra. Eventually, the Eisenstein, fleeing the Istvan III massacre, emerges from the warp right in front of the phalanx. Taking the majesty of this gigantic man-built flying moon space station Death Star, Nathaniel Garo of the Death Guard regales the story of Istvan III. Dorn almost kills Garo for even hinting that Horus could be a traitor, but as his story is substantiated across more survivors, including Iactin Kurs of the uh, Iactin Kurs the Half Herd. Of the Luna Wolves and the Remembrancer Euphrates Keeler, Dorne comes to realize the grim situation at hand. Dorne's eyes were alight with anger at his brother's misdeeds and unforgivable acts. He was torn between his wrathful retribution and his duty to the Emperor. And we've talked so much about the stoic, stony nature of Dorne, but all but I've purposely waited until this moment to really go into the true fire that resides below the surface of Rogel Dorne. While he is calculated and he is measured in his approach to warfare uh, and cooking, he is also prone to brooding over matters, you know, souring his mood and sending him into deep fits of vindictive rage. And this secondary nature would go on to color the Black Templars of the Second Founding in the many, many, many years to come. And another character, on that note, I guess, another character we haven't touched on and one that plays heavily into the aforementioned future chapter is First Captain Sigismund. A Terran-born Imperial Fist, Sigismund acted as the direct right hand of Dorne after leaving the Inuit Cluster. Renowned across the entire Imperium as a peerless swordsman, completely undefeated in single combat save for one instance with Yago Sevatarian of the Night Lords, who, you know, consequently headbutted him during the duel, but whatever gets the big W, right? But most of the Horus Heresy books are actually kind of told from the perspectives of the many first captains, or at least just captains in general of repute, of the many legions. So naturally, we would come to truly understand Sigismund's role in the galaxy, but moreover, the unique relationship between him and Dorne. This gives us a direct insight into the type of character that Rogel is, as Sigismund has a pretty tragic story that culminates in the creation of the Black Templar Templars, and I'd, I'd gladly go into that in a side video. Um, on that subject, if you guys are interested. So, after Horus's treachery was discovered, Dorne assembled a retribution fleet to act as the instrument for his wrath against his brother. Comprised of 30,000 Imperial Fists and 500 warships would set course for Istvan V to bring Horus to heel, joining up with the, their brother chapters to aid in the endeavor. Uh, brother legions, not chapters. <laughs> Sigismund instead stayed with his Primarch, surprising Dorne and ultimately playing into the further tragedy of Sigismund. With the board set, Dorne made way for Terra with the remainder of his forces to set up the defenses. Especially in these dire times, a fortified capital world was more important than ever. Now, I'm, I'm sorry if bringing Sigismund into this kind of confused you a bit, but it's important to help explain two of the big scenarios of the Solar Campaign. The first of which was a massive incursion by the Alpha Legion. Alpharius and Omegon, twin Primarchs of the Alpha Legion, have been set in motion for the Solar War far before the events of the Istvan Dropsite Massacre. The goal here was to plant as many quote-unquote sleeper cells of Alpha Legionnaires throughout the entirety of the Segmentum Solar, with the ultimate goal of penetrating the impenetrable, the Imperial Palace. Now you see, Dorn turned entire, the entire Sol system into a fortress into a series of perfunctory defense strata that acted as overlapping cover for each one, also known as defense in depth. You know, that, that's a pretty common term. But the objective would be to whittle down Horus' invading fleet by the time it reached Terra, and by then it would be easier to deal with. That's 
how Dorne had built this kind of defense structure, at least. The Alpha Legion was already well within those defenses, though. Inside of the Investiary, within the Imperial Palace, lay the combined statues of all the Primarchs. The nine traitor Primarchs had been covered up, though so the Alpha Legion destroyed all but the statue of Afer Alpharius and Rogel Dorn. A direct challenge to the defense of the Imperial Palace. This enraged Rogel Dorn, like, like someone photobombing an Instagram model's selfie at a music festival. Okay, okay, maybe, maybe not that histrionic, but he immediately took to rooting out the Legionnaires. Thus starts the Battle of Pluto, where a massive Alpha Legion fleet led by, Mal uh, by Alpharius, I keep wanting to say Malpharius, by Alpharius himself, drifted beyond the outermost defenses of the system by having the entire armada drift in stasis. Now, there are a lot of details to this story, but I'm going to save it primarily for Alpharius' video because it's more of a tale of his genius rather than anything else. I mean, yeah, sure, Dorne takes a part in it, but the, story, the actual telling of it actually is from his perspective anyway, so I'll save it for him. The primary objective, though, was Pluto's moon of Hydra, a major astropathic monitoring station. It would act as the first warning system to the rest of the Sol system, while also keeping in the or keeping uh, the Loyalist forces well informed about the movement of Horus's fleet. Leading the defense was First Captain Sigismund, you remember him, and the only available Imperial Fist ships, numbering no more than 30. The Imperial Fist's mastery of defense was put to the test as overwhelming odds were slowed to a crawl. Sigismund using overlapping fire, surgical counterattacks, and well-placed defenses to thwart the momentum of Alpharius's onslaught. Amongst the defenders were a contingent of the elite Terminators of the Imperial Fists, the Huskarls. We've talked about some of the other elite troops of other legions, right? Such as the uh, Atramentar of the Night Lords or the Fire Drakes of the Salamanders. As Sigismund and Archamus, the master of the Huskarls, were pitched in a losing fight against Alpharius, Rogel Dorn entered the system aboard the Phalanx with an Imperial Fleet in tow. I'm sorry, Imperial Fist Fleet. Archamus, mortally wounded on the floor of the station of the Onhydra, watched as his father battled his uncle. The two Primarchs locked in deadly combat, Alpharius's pale spear stabbing towards Dorne as he parried with his massive chainsword Storm's Teeth. Alpharius was poised for a killing blow, driving his spear deep into Dorne. Rogo had seen the blow coming, though, and stepped in the way, taking the stab directly on his... World of Warcraft level huge Imperial Eagle Pauldron. <laughs> Wogel Dorn then pinned his brother in place and sawed through Alpharius' wrists, severing his hands from his arms and slashed a deep ribbon of crimson down his chest before driving Alpharius' own spear into his chest. Just for good measure, Dorn then dropped Storm's teeth into Alpharius' skull, killing the Primarch instantly. And this is extremely important Alpharius marks only one of three Primarchs to die during the Horus Heresy, but most importantly, Dorne is the first Loyalist to kill a traitor Primarch. This ultimately results in Omegon assuming the identity of Alpharius as the Legion retreats from the Soul System. After the battle for Pluto, another major battle happened on Mars, the second battle of the Soul Campaign, during the Great Schism with the Mechanicus. Sigismund was able to recover a good portion of munitions and armor for use in the defense of Terra to come. Now, we don't know a ton of the details for the Siege of Terra just yet, as that is currently in motion in the Horus Heresy books, like I was saying. But we do know that the Imperial Fists held the walls of the Imperial Palace alongside their White Scars and Blood Angels brothers. The Primarchs of all three legions fighting were the battle was thickest and almost fierce. Then came the attack on the Vengeful Spirit, where the Emperor, Adeptus Custodus, Sanguinius and Dorne all teleported aboard Horus' flagship. And this story goes as we've told it before, but Dorne arrived too late to fight to help, having been teleported furthest from his father and brother. Dorne was left to discover the bodies of his brothers and father strewn about the bridge. Returning his father to Terra, Rogel Dorne was the last person to hear from the Emperor as he was interred upon the Golden Throne. The Emperor's final commands on how to rebuild the Imperium resounded in Rogel's ear as his father's body was put to rest upon the machine that would power his spirit for the many ages to come. After the heresy's conclusion, the weight of the entire Siege of Terra weighed heavily upon Rogel Dorn, not to mention the death of, the two, of two brothers in addition to the fatal wounding of his father. Dorn not only felt like a failure, but he also felt responsible. Who better to protect the Emperor than the Defiant One, the Praetorian of, Tor of Terra? The defining characteristic of Dorn is his duty, and in making it through the heresy, he felt as if he had failed that duty. 
The Emperor gave Rogal Dorn a sense of identity, and he felt as if he shattered that and betrayed the very ideals he stood for. Dorn's answer was a crusade of penitence, scouring the Imperium and purging any traitorous filth from the fragile Imperium. The Codex Astartes was eventually proposed to all the remaining Primarchs, reducing the legions to thousand strong fighting forces known as chapters as we know them today. This outraged Dorn, as he felt this was a punishment levied at him by his brothers for, for his failing in the defense of the Emperor. Worse still, Dorn figured that they were right in their blaming of him, increasing his already despondent move. The remaining Loyalist Primarchs were split once again, half of them wishing to adopt the Codex Astartes, while uh, Rogel Dorn, Lehman Russ, and Vulcan all really refused adamantly. It was definitely a heated time, with elements of the newly reformed Imperial Navy even firing upon an Imperial Fist's vessel. Dorn knew that the Imperium could not withstand another civil war. He needed a sign of sorts. He needed guidance. What he truly needed was his father. Now, I don't want this to be seen as a sign of weakness, but rather a very human moment from a Primarch that has always been overly stoic in the face of almost any situation. And that's what I think is, is the big thing here, is that the stone is kind of cracked, right? And we now see through the character armor of Dorne. And that is that is very telling and is very, you know, again, humanizing to an otherwise demigod. Though so Dorne took to flagellating instead of making throw rugs. Namely with an instrument called the pain glove. Dorne believed heavily in the notion that pain and strife pur purified the body and mind, giving purpose and resolve. This is a pretty gnarly device. Essentially, you're covered in electric diodes via a body glove, hence the name, pain glove, across your, well, entire body. A large metal collar prevents you from snapping your own neck while also injecting the brain with chemicals to prevent you from passing out. It's a wicked good time. Slanesh would be proud, but that's neither here nor there. Rogel was granted a vision within the playing glove by the Emperor in which he had to purify his legion in a sort of metaphorical pain glove of sorts. And to do this, Rogel Dorn answered the goading of his brother Perturabo. The Iron Warriors had erected a bastion on the, on the world of Sebastus IV, calling it the Iron Cage. Perturabo's challenge was simple, prove that he was the better of the two. Dorn declared that his entire legion would enter the proverbial gauntlet and come out the other side as chapters, adhering to the Codex Astartes. The Iron Cage was a massive death trap, though. Overlapping fire covered every entry into the Colossus Fortress. And this was designed solely to completely kill Rogel Dorn and his legion, satisfying the now demon Primarch Perturabo's shattered ego. And the Imperial Fists crashed into the cage, despite being at a gross disadvantage. They fought with all the zeal that was hidden deep within their character, overcoming each trap through sheer force of will alone, pushing deeper and deeper into the cage. Upon reaching the center, Dorne discovered that Perturabo wasn't there, and that the Iron Warrior's final trap was the surrounding of their brother Legion. Bobby G, boom, entered the system at the last moment, bringing the might of the Ultramarines to bear, aiding in the extraction of the Imperial Fists while the Iron Warriors escaped. And although massive casualties were sustained, the gauntlet was complete in Dorne's eyes, and in the Imperial Fists had been purified. For the next 20 years, the, success, the successor chapters of the Second Founding, the Crimson Fists and the Black Templars, exacted war on their parent legion's behalf while they reformed, or the, the Imperial Fists reformed as it were. And rising from the flames like a beautiful Imperial Aquila with stunner shades on, the Imperial Fists returned to battle with such a staunch adherence. Rising from the flames like a beautiful Imperial Aquila with stunner shades on, the Imperial Fists returned to battle with such a staunch adherence to the tenets of the Codex that they were second only to the Ultramarines themselves. As time went on, the Primarchs slowly died off or vanished one by one, with Dorn becoming one of the last Primarchs to fall. Shortly after the disappearance of Corvus Corax in the mid to late 31st millennium, the first of the 13 Black Crusades was launched. Rogel Dorn and the Imperial Fists were the first to respond, catching the traitorous forces as they mustered outside of the Eye of Terror. Dorn mounted an immediate counteroffensive, taking three Imperial Fist companies and leading a series of successful boarding actions, crippling engine bays, shutting down life support, and turning the weapons of one ship onto another many times over. As the Primarch destroyed a swathe of the enemy ships, they eventually cornered him aboard the Sword of Sacrilege. There, Rogel Dorn, the Praetorian of Terra, met his end. 
Surrounded by enemies on all sides, no one survived the engagement. His body was eventually discovered by the chief librarian who quickly recovered their Primarch. Now, I want to talk about a quick conflict, I guess. Yeah, a quick canon conflict on that. In the older lore, Rogel Dorn's body was never really found. Rather, his gauntlet was recovered, and on it was like inscribed every single chapter master since its recovery. And it was, it was kind of like a large rallying point uh, for not just the Imperial Fists, but all their, their founding chapters after that. And it was believed that he was lost somewhere in the warp or, or taken by the enemy, but that he would return with the enigmatic caveat of, the, you know, quote unquote, before the end times, that, that kind of situation. In fact, like almost every single Primarch in the old lore has like that Arthurian asterisk next to their name of like, oh, he will re return from Avalon. <laughs> we need him the most. But whichever you believe, the Imperial Fists lost their Primarch, but he birthed a wide spanning legacy of many chapters that bear the mark of Sons of Dorne. The Black Templars ride out in crusade in perpetuity. The Scions of Sigismund delivering the Emperor's zeal, while the Crimson Fists live up to their namesake, diving headlong into engagements across the galaxy. Rogaldorn is a figure that has always been a strong scaffolding to the lore, but has never had the true fleshing out of his more over-the-top or histrionic brothers. This, of course, does not cheat the Defiant One's grand legacy. Now remember, this is the only Legion, or well now chapter, that calls Terra their homeworld. The Phalanx is still in use to this day, although a shadow of its former self, most of its systems shutting down as to no longer supply a legion, but rather a chapter. The deep and spanning history of the Imperial Fists is filled with the same tenacity and fervor that their gene father created in all of them. There will always be an Imperial Palace, and there will always be Imperial Fists to defend it because of the dutiful sacrifices that Rogel Dorn laid down. Despite all of this, we see a very flawed character with a lot of human qualities. Loss, regret, guilt, all of them play their ugly hand across the matrix of Dorne's life post-heresy. From it arise two chapters whose names are synonymous with righteous vindication. The legacy of Dorne lives on through his sons, just as much through the words. The legacy of Dorne lives on through his sons, just as much through the worlds that they defend. Hopefully you enjoyed this video here today, and our next one will be on Conrad Kurz as I'm as I finish reading the new book on him. And then after that, we'll be doing the Great Con. He'll be my uh, next target. But guys, as always, thank you so much for watching here today. This one kind of turned out to be a lot longer than I originally ex um, intended for it to be. Um, I think Rogel Dorn has got so many interweaving points to him connected to so many other Primarchs that it was hard for me to really kind of skim this one down. But I do want to give a quick shout out to Crisps. He kind of helped me out on this, making sure that the ultimate narrative of it was a little bit more fo focused on Dorne and less on the Imperial Fist as a whole, as I kind of got a little segued in here um, every so often. So um, this is a very dense one. I do apologize about that. But I think at the same time, you guys don't really don't don't they don't mind that too much. But as always, guys, thanks so much for watching. Have a good one and take care.